Good afternoon. I'm Alex Silverman, brand manager at KYW News Radio, and it's fantastic to have all of you here at the headquarters of Odyssey. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Odyssey is a leading media and entertainment company with top local news, sports, and music brands across dozens of markets around the country, one of the largest podcasting platforms nationwide, and it's proud to be based right here in Philadelphia. At KYW News Radio, as many of you know, we've been informing this region nonstop for more than 55 years. First on AM radio, now proudly on 103.9 FM and smart speakers and on the Odyssey app. Informing our audience about what's happening locally and connecting people here to what's happening globally. So when the horrific events started to unfold in Ukraine and the World Affairs Council approached us about partnering on this event, it made total sense for us. Uh, because what we do every day is to verify information, to get perspectives from the leading experts and relate it to our lives here because we're all exposed to so much information and trusted sources are needed more than ever. So in that spirit, we're proud to present this conversation in hopes that it'll help you better understand what's happening and what the days ahead around here might look like. And now I'm pleased to welcome Haley Boyle, Vice President of Programs with the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Haley? Thank you, Alex. I'm so pleased that the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia and KYW News Radio have been able to work together on this important and timely event. For over 70 years, the Council has brought our community fresh, nonpartisan, civil discourse on critical issues affecting the world today. Uh, and today's program is no different. I'd like to now introduce our guest panelists and moderator for this discussion. First, we have Lisa Balioni, professor of political science at St. Joseph's University. Lisa has spent her career studying and writing about US and Soviet or Russian relations, superpower nuclear arms control, and Russian authoritarianism. Lisa has been one of our go-to experts for topics related to Russia and is now gracing our podium for a third time. Lisa, we're so grateful to have you speak to our audience again today and share your knowledge and expertise. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Catherine Miller-Wilson, Executive Director of HIAS Pennsylvania, which supports low-income immigrants of all backgrounds as they build new lives in the Pennsylvania community. Catherine has focused her career on social justice work, previously working for Community Legal Services, AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania, and teaching at Drexel and Villanova. Catherine, we're happy to have you with us today. And our third and final panelist is Lauren Swartz, President and CEO at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, and whom I have the pleasure of working with day to day. Lauren previously worked for the C City of Philadelphia as the Deputy Commerce Director of International Business and Global Strategy, during which time she focused on global business attraction, foreign direct investment, and promoting exports for the region and the local economy. Finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Ian Bush, anchor here at KYW News Radio. A versatile broadcaster, he's the recipient of two Edward R. Murrow Awards for sports reporting, and we're excited to have Ian moderating for us today as his lifelong career in radio has shaped him into a keen interviewer. Welcome to you all, and Ian, I'll pass the microphone off to you to start our discussion. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I just wanted to start with a little personal news, if I could. Um, after an amazing couple of years as an expert in emerging pathogens and immunology and vaccinology, I'm going to move on now. I'm now an authority on no-fly zones, uh, Eastern European affairs, post-Soviet states, uh, really all things geopolitics. So uh, I'm excited to make the most of uh, this new opportunity. Please follow, like, and subscribe. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, that is what it feels like to me. My social media feed has become, uh, my Twitter feed uh, is filled with hot takes on the war in Ukraine from people who had the same certainty of their own infallibility on the pandemic. So here today, we are after context. We are after history, nuance, knowledge. That's why I'm here, and that's why I'm sure you signed up to be here, and we are so lucky to be able to get that from, uh, from Lisa, Catherine, and Lauren. Um, just before I start peppering them with questions, th this war has been moving so fast, so many developments. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just wanted to update you on the reporting that I've seen within the last hour from uh, some of our trusted sources. Uh, the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv says Russian forces have kidnapped more than 2,300 children from Ukraine. 
Ukraine's foreign ministry accusing Russia of directing people fleeing the attacks into the uh, breakaway eastern regions it controls under the guise of humanitarian assistance. Uh, Italy's prime minister today says Ukraine should be allowed to join the European Union. Poland is calling on the U.S. to exclude Russia from the G20, the group of uh, major economies. And the United Nations Secretary General called the war unwinnable today. Antonio Guterres said sooner or later it will have to move from the battlefields to the peace table. That's inevitable, he said. The only question is how many more lives must be lost? How many more bombs must fall? So perhaps a good place for us to start is with Lisa. Uh, and Professor, I imagine the answer to this uh, question could fill a book as it goes back to Crimea, back to the fall of the Soviet Union, back probably further still. How did we get here? How did it come to war? Hi, everybody. It's really a thrill to be here. Um, I think I'll start with the end of the Soviet Union and try to give it a quick, a, a quick pass through 30 years. So it's important to note that the Soviet Union collapsed in a really surprising manner. People didn't expect it, and it was it, it happened um, as a result of the coup against Gorbachev in August, and then although there had been nationalist movements brewing throughout the old Soviet Union, those last four months, uh, the nationalism took center stage, and most of the republics, which are now the independent states, sought their independence, and none more important was uh, was Ukraine's effort at independence. And in December of 1991, they voted overwhelmingly, Ukrainians that is, to leave the Soviet Union. And that was the nail in the coffin for the Soviet Union that Yeltsin in Russia took and ran with, as well as the leader of Ukraine and others, to create independent states and basically force Gorbachev out of a job and kill the Soviet Union. Um, the 90s are a period of independence of those 15 former republics and now independent states. And uh, Russia's economy goes through an, a very, very difficult time as it's trying to transform to capitalism. It's trying to create a democracy. Similar things are happening in Ukraine. Uh, there is a lot of dislocation. The economic collapse is uh, comparable, some would say worse, than what the Americans experienced during the Great Depression. Uh, Ukraine similarly has difficulties. So the 90s are this very, very difficult period, uh, identified with Yeltsin. At the end of the 90s, uh, Vladimir Putin becomes the leader of Russia as a result of various other decisions. Uh, Putin is trying to, in 2000, reclaim uh, Russian greatness and rebuild Russian power. And he clamps down on all of the openness, except for economic openness. He wants to have a market economy, but it's, a, it's a, what some people call a kleptocratic state. Uh, but important to Putin's building is to uh, clamp down on independence, independent media, independent activists, and independent parts of old Russia, of Russia like Chechnya, which is really violent. And as he moves forward into the 20, as the 2000s continue uh, he, and Russia is empowered, he also puts his sights on uh, trying to undo what he sees as Russia's, um, Russia's loss of status and power. And that's when you see him trying to uh, and succeeding in regaining uh, territory in, in Georgia and then going after Ukraine. Uh, Crimea is an interesting place. Crimea had originally been, or not originally, but uh, since Catherine the Great, Crimea had been part of Russia, the Russian Empire. Even in the Soviet Union, Crimea was part of, believe it or not, the Russian Republic until 1954, when Khrushchev decides to give Crimea to the Ukrainians as a symbol of their eternal friendship. And this was seen as not that important. It would be like, uh, it would be like Cape May being given to uh, Delaware in the United, I mean, you know, it's, it's right there and you know, who cares? It's just state borders don't matter, right? State borders, nobody, Khrushchev never imagined. Uh, and so we see that, that that redrawing of the border has significance 
And that's one of the reasons Putin decides to take, take back uh, and seeks to take back Crimea, seeks to also take back territories in the eastern part of Ukraine. Again, because from, at, from Putin's perspective, the old republic borders were never supposed to be uh, national, international borders. And, and in his mind of greatness, Russia deserves those. There are also lots of Russian speakers. Crimea especially has uh, lots of retired uh, uh, military folks, especially naval folks, because that was the site of a, of a very important Soviet military base. Did I say that right, Crimea? Yeah, I've probably gone on too long, so I want to oh. give you a chance to, um, to ask no, again. It's very instructive, Hello. thank you. And uh, I, I remember talking about Crimea. The only thing I associate with now is the annexation of Crimea. Right. We say that as if it was eh, Russia annexed Crimea. We've all moved on. Do you think that the West has shown it will tolerate Russian aggression to a point where it doesn't want to involve itself, the West doesn't want to involve itself in military conflict. So Russia can do what it wants to a point. Right, I think you're pointing at, Ian, some of the mistakes that the West made. And part of that, I want to underline that, that there, was a, there was a sense among some that perhaps Russia did have a legitimate, legitimate claim to Crimea. That's why I provided that history for you, although others would say absolutely not, because once you create international borders, international law says you don't, and, and being a UN member, once you uh, sign on to the UN, all states are pledged not to change borders with force. So, so you're, you're right, we, we, and, and that's similar with Georgia. So in Georgia, where uh, uh, Putin in 2008 was aggressive, you, you have these two other pieces of Georgia called Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which are these, which are homelands and, and territories that are the homes to these different ethnicities, Abkhaz and Ossetians. Now, most Americans have never heard of them, right? But, and they felt they didn't belong in Georgia. So Russia was saying, uh, we'll support the Abkhaz and the Ossetians in their independent move. And in a way, the Americans and the West were chastened because guess what we had done? In the breakup of the old Yugoslavia, what did we say? We said, oh, Bosnians want to be independent of Serbia. Croats want to be independent of Serbia. And so it comes back to bite us. And I think that that earlier support for national self-determination, which you know, many of us learned about that when we learned about World War I, right? And that was a good thing. All of a sudden, these little small peoples that folks like us have never really heard of are saying they want it. And I think that allowed uh, Americans in the West to say, okay, just these. Now, a, a more important, perhaps, violation or two more important violations would be the cyber attack on Estonia in 2007, which if you think about NATO, uh, if that truly is a, an attack on a NATO member, should have invoked Article 5. And then, of course, the crossing of the red line in Syria with the use of chemical weapons I think those are, are really important. Sure. And uh, Lauren, we were speaking today on the morning news on KYW that uh, President Biden is warning about uh, potential information security cyber attacks on our critical infrastructure, on American companies, which certainly could have an economic impact. Uh, as we have heard assurances from the White House that no American troops would be on the ground in the war. Uh, from the Pentagon that enforcing a no-fly zone is a non-starter, it would only escalate the war. So we have turned to sanctions to punish Russia, to punish Putin and his cronies. Uh, what kind of impact are the sanctions having on Russia and are they also impacting our economy, Philadelphia's economy even? The sanctions on 
Russia are certainly having an impact, how they're motivating or not motivating Vladimir Putin to make changes is what we don't know yet, right? And it's becoming ever more difficult to understand what's going on inside of Russia as large, some of the large companies that have left are tech and media companies as well, right? And so the lockdown on media in Russia is making it hard to get that information. Uh, they're certainly having an effect all around the world. We have supply chains, inflation, energy prices, all of these things we were already dealing with as a global society and global economy in the aftermath or current uh, COVID pandemic as it continues to unfold. And so what we see going on in Russia, in Ukraine, in the war, and the economic storyline of that is amplifying all of the challenges that we were already facing because of COVID. When we look at the, what the business community is doing in addition to the sanctions, it's, it's almost like a public-private partnership. You know, whether anybody shook, it, shook their hand, we don't know, but this is really unprecedented. The level of sanctions that we're seeing being rolled out by countries all over the world and countries who previously didn't participate in sanctions and economic sanctions is like nothing we've ever seen before. So that combined with the darkness of, of the Russian information system means it's really hard to know what's going on. And what we do know a little bit more about is what other companies are doing. They are making public statements, they're pulling out their operations, their employees, they're severing ties, they're, they're disinvesting within the Russian economy. And that is similar to sanctions, but operates in a parallel track. The impact of those together will be felt most personally within the Russian people. And one thing we talked about earlier, Catherine, is that in the Russian society, upsetting the Russian people to try and have them sort of raise up and put pressure on the Russian government to change course is unlikely to happen. And so that's also a big question mark. You can put all the sanctions you want and you can take away the McDonald's and the Google and the H&M and the Toyota and all of these businesses, but does Putin care? And at what point will that pain for the Russian people translate into pressure on the government to make change? We don't know. We've never done this before. And what the motives are of Vladimir Putin right now are also, uh, people have many opinions about that. But it doesn't seem like pain, preventing pain to individual people, families, children, is something that is what's motivating him to make any kind of decision right now. So right. what we can expect is that the sanctions may continue. The pressure on businesses will to continue to pull out of Russia will continue, which also creates a vacuum of power, economic opportunity, and infrastructure for Putin to fill in whatever way he sees best. And the Russian people see what's happened to Alexei Navalny just today, sentenced to another nine and a half years in maximum security prison. Mm -hmm. They see what happens to protesters who are brave enough to hit the streets of Moscow, detained, and Lord knows what happens to them then. Uh, and we have companies like Nestle that are on a lot of people's minds because yeah. Nestle is one that has not pulled out of mm -hmm. doing work in, in Russia, despite the public pressure from President Zelensky, despite uh, pressure on Twitter from from people, um, the world's biggest food company says it supplies the population with important food, the population of Russia, mm -hmm. and is doing whatever it can to help alleviate this humanitarian catastrophe. Um, Catherine, a, a humanitarian catastrophe to be sure. The war has forced one in four Ukrainians from their homes, more than 10 million people we're talking here. And the United Nations says about a third of them have fled across international borders a, as refugees. Uh, your organization exists in support of immigrants and has had a lot on its plate recently. Uh, Ukraine is only the latest displacement crisis in our, in our world. Talk about what Hyas Pennsylvania does. Yeah, so thank you very much, Ian. So we're, we're an on-the-ground direct services organization. We provide refugee resettlement as well as immigration legal services. Um, and one thing that's important to note for people to understand is Highest Pennsylvania is separate and independent from Highest Inc. Highest Inc. is a national and international organization. We are affiliated with them for purposes of refugee resettlement because of the way that that works. But we are separate and independent. So, um, so just that note. Um, so yes, we've had a lot of our, on our plates. And as you said, this is the third worldwide displacement crisis that we've experienced in the last six months. And that falls on our shoulders, um, our shoulders and other nonprofits like us. So how does it fall on our shoulders? Not in the way that you would think. Um, so the Ukrainians that are fleeing right now, 
they are in fact not allowed to enter the United States. So um, there has been a lot of articles highlighting, for example, two Harvard students who set up a housing app. That's great internationally. It's completely ineffective in the United States. Ukrainians are not, do not have the visas necessary to enter, and they will not have those unless our federal government allows them to have them. So something that people don't understand is that our immigration law and policy from the very beginning, the very first acts, is about exclusion. Every person that enters the country is an exception to that rule. So what happened in Haiti uh, there was an earthquake, their president was assassinated, that did not give them refugee status. So the only way that Haitians were allowed to enter this country is if they had already entered before those disasters happened and then were eligible for temporary protected status to remain. So that's one way that we helped. When Afghanistan happened uh, and Kabul fell, Afghans also were not allowed to enter this country. So how did we airlift 170,000? Because Afghans helped the military, President Biden decided to make an exception to our exclusionary rule and granted them something called humanitarian parole. This is an entry visa, not a legal status. So every Afghan that made it to the airport in August was given humanitarian parole was airlifted to our military bases, and at the military bases, they were provided with the security clearances that normally happen overseas. Those clearances were expedited, so normally they take 10 years. At the military bases, they took between 30 and 45 days. Once the clearances were done, they were sent to agencies like ours to resettle them. But in order to resettle them, it took another exception, an act of Congress, because again, humanitarian parole is an entry visa, not a status. So they weren't eligible to be resettled by our agencies until September 30th, when Congress said, okay, fine, you can use federal dollars to actually resettle them, and you can give them the same benefits as refugees, which includes work authorization, health insurance, um, and the right to stay. So we did that, and we resettled 110 Afghans in Philadelphia. We finished resettling our last Afghan in January. But are we done with that population? Absolutely not, because, again, they were given an entry visa, not refugee status. So now, by law, by the same law that was passed on September 30th, they are forced to file for asylum. So we are representing those 110 in asylum proceedings. The asylum proceedings are very individualized. So our attorneys are experiencing these terrible questions by, um, by examiners, asylum examiners, who are saying, OK, but how were you personally threatened by the Taliban? And if you cannot show me that you were personally threatened, we will not grant you asylum. And if there is any evidence that you helped the Taliban, and that includes giving them a drink of water. That can be considered trig. Terrorism, uh, something, 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 meaning terrorism assistance. And so then you can be excluded from getting asylum if you provided assistance to the Taliban. So these Afghans are still at risk. And they have to get asylum within two years because two years is when their entry visa expires. And their relatives who didn't make it to the airport, who got separated from them in the chaos, did not get humanitarian parole. They are stuck in Afghanistan and there is no way to get them out. So we have resettled a family that got separated from their two-year-old. We've been lobbying with the State Department as hard as we can. They were resettled in September. It is now March 22nd, and they are still separated from their two-year-old. We resettled a man who got separated from his pregnant wife and his three kids. We resettled another man who got separated from his wife and his two adult daughters. Um, the stories of family separation are a thousandfold. And right now, our government has done nothing to allow them to come to the United States. So then came Ukraine. And now there's two million people that have fled. Europe has taken them in, thank goodness, because the United States has not. So 
The United States on March 1st said, okay, fine, Ukrainians that are here, that got here before March 1st can have temporary protected status. Who are those people? Those are people that got tourist visas, student visas, they were here on a temporary basis when war broke out in their homeland and they couldn't go home. So Highest Pennsylvania is representing them to help them get temporary protected status. But temporary protected status gives them work authorization and the ability to stay here for 18 months. It doesn't give them access to health insurance. It doesn't allow them to stay beyond 18 months. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't permit them to petition for family members. So they can stay. Anyone that somehow makes it across the border after March 1st is not eligible for temporary protected service uh, status. Excuse me. Those that are, want to be declared a refugee so that they can be resettled in the United States eventually have to go through the United States vetting process, which since September 11th is the most rigorous in the world. It's an eight to 10 step process. Each step along the way is time sensitive. And so it takes years to get vetted by that process. So that's what's happening. Afghanistan should have been easy. They actively <laughs> helped the United States. So if we can't get Afghanistan done, how do we help Haitians? How do we help Ukrainians? Right. And on and on. Well, so the way to help them is to change our immigration law and policy, particularly in this moment where there are staffing crises in every industry, where baby boomers are retiring, and because of the birth rate decline, which has happened for more than a decade, there's no young people to take their place, where innovation is stagnating. We need immigrants almost more than they need us. So we need to change our policies from exclusion to inclusion. Exclusion should be the exception, not the rule. We desperately need immigrants, and we're shutting them out, which doesn't make any sense. Lisa, uh, part of your scholarly focus is, has to do with superpower nuclear arms control. Uh, Russia is said to have the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. When it comes to that, and this war, this moment in time, what's your level of concern? Oh boy, I am very worried. Um, the, the issue initially is not the use of strategic arms. We, strategic arms are the, are the weapons that have, are long range, that can be launched from Russia and hit the United States and vice versa. Right? And, but, but we always worry that crossing a certain threshold of violence will move us to weapons of mass destruction, whether we're talking chemical or nuclear. And then once uh, those are used, once that threshold is crossed, there's the worry about escalation, either intentional or accidental. Um, so it is huge, and it's huge. I, I'm worried, or I worry about these things, particularly because uh, the Russians have integrated in their war game and their war plans the uses of uh, what we call tactical, as opposed to strategic, in other words, shorter range weapons. And they practice the, in their war games a transition to the use of, of tactical nukes uh, in, a, in a very, um, how do I want to say this, casual manner. You know, that, that, that the transition will, 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 be, will be seamless and, and rather casual. So that is the worry. And the worry, and then what would that, what would that provoke? I, I, um, we also worry that that the Russians are getting um, frustrated with their lack of progress, uh, and particularly in the ability to take Kyiv and to decapitate, sorry, using that, that, those euphemisms from uh, strategic language, but their ability to capture the government and, and destroy it uh, and to bring Ukraine to its knees. And so a number of military analysts are really worried that uh, Putin will turn to either chemical weapons or potentially on the battlefield uh, nuclear weapons. And I, I listened to uh, respected analysts say the reason that uh, chemical weapons are so frightening 
uh, too, is that chemical weapons, the, they're easy to make. Uh, chlorine gas is, we, all, we use chlorine in our pools, and chlorine gas is deadly. Uh, we've been making it uh, since World War I. Uh, but the other thing about chlorine, chlorine is that it, it falls to the ground and penetrates air raid shelters. And so what happened in Syria was the use of chemical gas was able to kill thousands of people very quickly. And from what I understand, it helped to terrorize the population and, and break the souls of some uh, and the, the resistance. That's the worry that that kind of that a chemical uh, attack will happen to try to break and terrorize Ukrainians into giving up. Um, so that's where you see, I would say, the administration struggling, American administration and NATO. How will we respond to chemical? How would we respond to um, the use of a battlefield? nuclear weapon because the risks are so great that you would trigger uh, a, a, you know, a, a potential nuclear strikes. And I was listening to some folks talking about, well, can we have symbolic uses of them, you know, show them we can hit uh, a place that is far from mm. everyone. But we're forgetting that nuclear weapons don't just kill for today. They poison soil. They interfere with our biology so that they create cancers and they create um, ways to kill us for the future. And that's even in a small strike because the destructive power of the weapons of today have magnified uh, so much. I mean, the things. Yeah, they're so much more powerful than what we've seen, what we saw in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as we discussed earlier, Syria, if we did nothing when right. the chemical attacks there happened on children and right. others, why, right. why now? I know. And, and that, you know, again, with deterrence, which is, you know, you make these threats to make clear uh, what, what will set, what will uh, provoke a punishment. But in order for deterrence to work, you have to have the capability and your threats have to be credible. And the Obama administration said that the use of chemical weapons would be a red line crossed, and it was crossed, and nothing happened. Um, and that is a huge mistake. Lauren, uh, we talked about the economic consequences mm -hmm. of the war, but there is other trade that happens between countries, cultural trade, and that too has been affected. And when we think about diplomacy, there are many, many kinds of diplomacy, right? There's a capital D diplomacy with the State Department and elected officials, and there's military diplomacy, sometimes turns into war. We're seeing there's cultural diplomacy, students studying abroad, art exchanges, ballerinas, you name it, right? And, and business and trade is a form of diplomacy, and for many years, uh, you know, the World Trade Center Association, their motto is, trade makes peace. That's ambitious and hopeful, and that's we should be ambitious and hopeful, but maybe we could flip it and say trade can help prevent war, right? If you've got a lot of lines of business with another organization, you're less likely to attack it. And so I think it's particularly worrying if we really strip all commercial relationships between Russia, not just in the United States, where that relationship on a dollar value isn't actually that significant to the United States, but with the rest of the world, not only does that further anger, anger Putin and his regime and make them feel even more frustrated to build on what Lisa was saying, but it strips away some protections to say, well, I have employees there, or we get our grain from there and our energy from there. We can't go to war with them. And that's, you know, you look at China as a parallel situation, and we certainly don't have time to broach the topic of Chinese uh, relations with the United States or, or maybe even Russia in this conversation. But trade is a form, and business are a form of diplomacy. And they're people-to-people -people diplomacy as well as governmental diplomacy that has infrastructure internationally around it, but also just happens on, on an ad hoc level. And when that all starts to break down, and you, we break down the cultural piece of it too, and, and Russians are being attacked and threatened all over the world with racism and xenophobia as well, 
and students are being pulled out of school, and, uh, and Russian restaurants are closing, and ballerinas and conductors are, are resigning, either resigning their Russian citizenship or resigning from their positions. When all these things start to disappear, what we have left are guns, and in this case, chemical weapons and nuclear war. And when all you have left are guns and weapons, you're much more likely to continue with war. So just hitting, stripping away all other uh, modes of diplomacy is also a very dangerous situation. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. The question asking, I think we have uh, some questions from the audience and from, uh, do we have a, a school uh, question as well? All right, we're going to walk around with a microphone uh, for you to ask our panelists. Just uh, tell us your name and uh, where you're from, please. I'm Larry Goldberg. I'm a member of the World Affairs Council. Um, there's been some discussion as to why Putin chose to invade now, given that he's been obsessed with Ukraine for maybe 20 years already. And some Republican politicians have been claiming that this would not have happened had Trump been president and that Biden somehow, his administration has been weak or uh, inept in dealing with Russia. So though my question is, why now? Good question. Um, I would say that the reason for the invasion today is it's complicated, obviously. I do think that the 30-year anniversary of the end of the Soviet Union was important to Putin. I would also say that Putin was surveying what has been happening for the last few years in uh, including, and actually very importantly, including Trump administration uh, policies towards Europe and towards NATO, and looking at both the United States and Europe, not believing that we would hang together, right? Remember, the Helsinki conference or the Helsinki summit between Trump and Putin is, and, and prior to that, there was a NATO conference in which uh, President Trump doubts Article 5, and he doubts whether we should even be a part of NATO. And then Trump goes and meets with Putin in Helsinki and makes it clear that he believes Putin as opposed to believing the FBI or the CIA um, uh, on, on what, what has been happening. So there's enough blame to go ar around. But I do also think that, and here I disagree a little bit with, with Lauren, I do think that Putin believed that Russia's economic power over the, especially the Europeans, with respect to oil and gas, was going to allow him to get away with this. So he, he believed that it's very interesting because and it shows you why he's not a Marxist, um, that, these, that these economic ties would, would bind the um, Europeans to him, and especially the, the oil and gas. And he miscalculated. He also, I think it's very important that Angela Merkel was gone, uh, and she had just uh, left her position in, early, uh, in the early fall or mid-fall, and, uh, and that the new coalition in Germany was made up of uh, left-leaning uh, folks, and I think Putin thought they wouldn't have the ability. I think Putin also calculated that this country was just too divided, and he had too many folks who would um, see Russian uh, authoritarianism as a positive thing. So there are, and, and, and we do have to give um, negative credit to the, the way that the pullout from Afghanistan was managed. So there's a lot of reasons, uh, but ultimately it's Vladimir Putin and this larger constituency that he represents in, within the elite in Russia of having an imperial ambition and seeking to show his power to the world. So more than just the eastward expansion of NATO, much more. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I would just like to say that, again, we really need to understand that Putin comes to power in the early 2000s as part of a, as, as a part of a, of a, as one wing of the, of the Russian political spectrum that those who, Yeltsin really didn't even have any idea of the extent to which 
he was affiliated with or believed uh, in greater uh, Russian imperial kinds of ideas, Eurasianism and the like. And, and so we didn't know where he was going. He's very important for under, understanding this problem. Another question. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Chris Nagel, I'm a member. Um, and I know we touched on um, the economic impact of, of the people and how tough it might be for them to rise up um, to kind of force Putin's hand. Is the hope that sanctions or, or the economic impact on his inner circle or the oligarchs would be something that could maybe have them pull the strings to pull him back? Or are you worried uh, they're also like-minded and, and the change might not really matter there? I, it's hard to say, right? Because the oligarchs are all over the world and other countries are having to react and, and try and manage these situations. The fact that some oligarchs have actually voiced negative opinions or dissent with Putin publicly is, is shocking to most people. And we're all sort of waiting to see if we see those folks again. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, um, and, and so we don't know. It, it's not clear yet. And do the oligarchs actually have any power over Putin? Has he concentrated his power and concentrated his power and concentrated his power since the, over the period that Lisa discussed so that there's really, can anybody get to him? Can anybody turn the ship? and give him some different perspective. Is that the Russian people with the pain and suffering that they're going through of economic sanctions? Certainly not. Can that happen from the level of the oligarchs? It doesn't seem to be working right now, but that's such a, a black box of relationship. It's unclear. Can I just add a little bit to that? Um, the logic is, if you think of, Putin's sources of his own legitimacy and his own authority. He has relations with, all, with, with the folks who have the oligarchs as well as the security services. They are and they are often intertwined. Um, and the understanding is partially that it's only through pain of those folks that he might be he might have to reconsider because those folks have been so integrated into the Western economy and enjoying the benefits of the Western lifestyle. Although Putin will tell you that, you know, we are full of decadence and horror and, and all kinds of terrible things. Well, then why do they all come in, you know, summer in, on, on, on the Mediterranean and come to Florida in the, in the winter? Um, and so that is part of the part of the calculus, uh, as well as the pain on ordinary people, which is is terrible because they really don't have much power. Uh, but hoping or, or, or expecting that that might raise uh, get them to ask some questions: Why is this happening? Doesn't does this emperor wear clothes still? Um, but it, it's, it's a very risky strategy, uh, and it's a very painful one. Anybody from in Iran, Iran would tell you that too. Uh, that's been our, our approach to Iran, and you see how far that's gotten us. But uh, as somebody who, uh, oops, sorry, who uh, believes, I, I actually think it's a really Im important for now moral stance to, to shut out the, olig the oligarchs. Mm -hmm. I just, I just want to add to that, you know, that the, the other piece getting behind the, both of these answers is that we're responding from a Western democratic perspective about how things work. And, you know, the recognition that, that Russia and Putin's legitimate, legitimacy is a completely different cultural, um, you know, picture. And so, so again, I mean, I had said uh, when we were when we were talking about preparation. I mean, I don't I don't pretend to be a diplomat. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing this, but I also think that we have to take with a grain of salt our expectation that imposing what we would believe to be successful on a completely different society mm. is is not likely to succeed. Um, so. I, I have to say one more thing. Um, the folks who have designed this strategy understand very well that, and, and we've learned the hard way about how sanctions may or might or might not work. 
and they are taking into account the way that authoritarianism works in Russia. And so that is why the sanctions are targeted at the, at the oligarchs specifically uh, as a, the only way to influence or, or one of the best ways to influence Putin. And you'll hear people like Michael McFall, who was the former ambassador and a great student of uh, Russian politics, saying we have to do more to reach out to the Soviet military, to Soviet uh, corporate, or excuse me, I said Soviet, Russian military, <laughs> Russian, so, Russian uh, corporate leaders to make it clear to them that they don't want to be on this side. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the thing about when highly authoritarian regimes fall, they are, it's always surprising. You can't tell it's going to happen because people aren't able to let their true feelings out because they will be squashed. But that's what we're hoping, and maybe wrongly, but that's the, we're trying to give those folks the incentives to put pressure on, uh, and the pressure could be just to say, you know, hey, Vlad, <laughs> you want to rule till 2036. Uh, you, you know, this is the, it's better to find a way to get out of this now before we destroy the Russia that you love. And I wonder if the embarrassment that perhaps he feels with the war not going his way, unless he believes his own propaganda, is, could be a, a death blow to him. I don't know. Well, this is where the fact that he has such control over the news right. media is, uh, is really important. And he's going to impose, and he is imposing, really enormous repression. So. Uh, my name's Bob. Uh, I'm a World Affairs Council member from Philadelphia. Uh, my question is, is, do you, anybody see any hope that China could be part of the solution to this problem somehow, some way? that uh, would, would make things get better somehow? That's a, that's a great question. I think it's one that's on everybody's mind. My sort of flip response is, only if it serves China's interests. Uh, and that's not a good enough answer. And I'd love to hear Lisa's perspective on this as a, a, a professor in this area. China is, of course, paying deep attention, has intelligence on all sides of this equation and is going to do what will serve China best. They're learning lessons, they're watching, they're also testing the US-Western alliance, how strong is NATO, the, what, how, how we fumbled our, that's not even a big enough word, our, our um, departure from Afghanistan, what's happening to all these refugees around the world, the strength or not of the American democracy. China is thinking, well, this is just a really good movie to watch. Um, <laughs> and see, we're taking really good notes and they've got intelligence everywhere to study so that it benefits their own geopolitical strategy. Might China, is China already involved in some way that we don't know, perhaps, it's pretty likely. Uh, they're not one to, to do nothing. Um, but they also stand behind sovereignty and borders, and they have a very strong position of, you know, you do yours, I'll do mine. And that's been a part of how they've built up what they've built up over the past few decades. And so China would also be cautious to stick their finger in or become a moral leader or have really strong leading opinions about what another country should do. Because that is the last thing they want anyone to tell China is what to do. And I wonder if China sees what's happening with Russia and Ukraine and thinks, hmm, Taiwan, maybe exactly. we shouldn't. Absolutely. And I would just say, too, that um, the hope is, so, so China and Russia are very tightly tied where China gets, I think I, 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 think I remember, about 50% of its energy mm -hmm. from Russia. And that's incredibly important. But the US is also incredibly important as a market, right, for China. Um, and so I do see China as the only hope in a way, uh, but I don't know how it works out because she and Putin have been very closely aligned on the idea that the West is decadent, the West is the past, uh, the West has created a, 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 an international system that we disagree with. 
But I also hear Lauren saying, but China will do what's best for China. And so that calculation, uh, she is preparing for uh, his, in a sense, a, a kind of coronation. He's breaking the rules about the two-year term limit and looking forward to being uh, president for life, basically. And so we have to see how that all plays out. Um, and, and yeah, I, it's a great question. Hi, um, I'm Jeffrey. I'm a student at the Haverford School. Um, and I kind of have two questions, both relating to youth. Um, my first is, what are the consequences of the war on both displaced Ukrainian youth and those who are still stuck in the country? Um, and my second would be, does Putin care about the, re the resistance that uh, um, has been shown by the younger population in Russia? And how does this conflict affect Russia's future and Russia's youth? Well, <laughs> so uh, what I can say is that uh, the youth are traumatized universally, right? Um, so, so there are those that, that are fleeing. Either they were separated from their parents, their parents tried to get them to safety, um, or they fled with their parents, or they witnessed their parents being killed, or they're stuck uh, hiding in the rubble, suffering from bombs and, uh, and any number of other um, you know, concerns and fears and all of that stuff. So, so we have an unaccompanied minor program um, in this country. And if you're an unaccompanied minor, a uh, court just ruled that you can't be expelled at our southern border um, despite Title 42, which is the public health regulation. You have to be allowed in to claim asylum. Um, if you are, so if you make it to um, Central and South America and then you try to cross, you can be allowed in, you get sent to a shelter, uh, one of any number of federal, federally funded shelters across the United States, and then programs like ours represent you. We, we staff a federally run shelter uh, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, and so we try to help those kids get resettled, but they have a hard, journey ahead, particularly if they have no family members, then they have to go to federal foster care, um, and they have to learn the language, and they have to process the trauma that they're undergoing. Um, that said, in terms of a youth movement, I mean, I can't speak authoritatively about that, but I can speak at just as a, as a citizen watching, watching the newspaper, seeing youth rise up all over the world for climate change in Hong Kong, and, you know, and possibly in Russia, and you know, it's <laughs> that there is hope, right? That uh, that young people um, are more resilient and um, and more courageous, and and you know, will will rise up and say, you know, that that we need to put an end uh, to this kind of behavior to to Putin and to um, to nationalism, and that leads to this kind of. Um, war and destruction. But. One of the things that we've observed with the business businesses exiting Russia is that they've done it really, really quickly. And in most cases, they've had a very strong PR strategy. Um, which, so in addition to all of this unprecedented nature of how things are playing out, that's been unique. And what we understand has happened is that the pressure that has been in corporations for a number of years, is climate change, racial justice, COVID coming from a different lens in a certain sense has, but climate change and racial justice, a lot of time coming from young people and businesses saying our, our company, our brand can't sustain this. So they have created playbooks to react quickly to public pressure. Now that's not necessarily what's going on inside of Russia, but the youth, um, the youth movements and the voice that young people have and the influence that they've been able to garner over businesses and governments to make change has allowed those institutions, which are often slow moving and sometimes fumbling, to do better in this instance. Or, well, better remains to be seen, I think, but to move more quickly and more efficiently to make decisive choices when it comes to business activity in Russia. And, and I would also say, if you think about young people, um, in the 2011 
uh, what, what sometimes is called the white or the snow revolution in Russia. It wasn't really a revolution, it was an uprising in, in 2011 in December that continues into 2012. Uh, much of that was located, or concentrated in the big cities and was youth oriented, but I'm defining youth as an older person, so we're talking about under 35, right? And, um, and, and those folks were very much challenging because that is 2011, 2012 is really when you see a sh a, an outward sh or a shift in the way uh, Putin begins to define his legitimacy, his his strategy for staying in power, and he becomes far more obviously authoritarian, anti-Western, and starts making this argument that he's a values president. And those values are what he would call traditional values, whereas the West and liberalism has, by becoming too sensitive to feminism, too sensitive to gender inclusion, has lost its way and become decadent. Um, and so he has alienated much of cosmopol much of um, urban youth, but there's the much broader uh, Russian population. I do think that this war and the toll it's going to take on very young Russians, right? Those young men, and it's predominantly men, serving, uh, and, and then on their families, uh, because so many of them didn't even know they were going off to war. They didn't realize where they were headed, and they're, and they're surprised they're at war. So that will be the really interesting question, and the other interesting element will be how do the soldiers' families react? Because believe it or not, soldiers' mothers in Russia and the old Soviet Union have been a really important social movement since the 1980s, part of the, Af the anti-Afghan uh, war and then part of the anti-Chechen war were mothers. Hmm. And, and, so, and those groups still exist now what, and they were allowed be, to exist in a sense, even in the old Soviet space, because it was, it was mothers doing what mothers should do, which is advocate for their children. But they were also being very critical of policy. And it's going to be really interesting. So right before the war started, the Duma passed a law which allowed for mass graves in times of emergency. So it's highly likely that all those young men who are going to be killed and who have been killed in Ukraine are not going to come home. They're going to be buried in mass graves. And how are their families going to react when there is no body? And even if they don't react, what are they thinking? Because they can't, maybe if they're afraid. So it's a really, tra it's, it's just so tragic. We have time for one more question. A microphone is coming to. Terry Shepard from Bryn Mawr. We're all looking for someone, some group, some place to, to end this. Uh, I don't think Superman's gonna intervene. Would the Russian military be a possibility? Uh, Putin has removed a number of generals. Uh, surely the people next in line don't feel very comfortable in their, their safety. Is it possible between that and the embarrassment of how poorly they're performed that they may take Putin out? It's a really interesting question. One of Putin's brilliant moves, and this is very typical for a personalist dictator, is there really isn't anyone clearly next in line. There is no succession plan. And so the issue is often, well, what would happen next and who would, so you'd need to have a lot of cooperation among those at the top levels uh, to decide how to manage this. That's number one. But the other thing that's very interesting, if you go back to that coup, that attempted coup that I mentioned in August of 1991, the folks who planned that coup were uh, uh, 
highly, um, how would I say, people very well connected in the KGB and at, on the uh, extreme, on the extreme wing of the party, the traditionalist wing of the party. When people demonstrated throughout the Soviet Union, the military was called out. The military was not willing to fire on grandmothers, on daughters, on their fathers maybe, and so you had a split in the military. So I think your question is a really good one about whether the military, if there is a questioning, whether that would ultimately force a change. Um, I don't think we're gonna see an action against Putin via the military, but I, I could imagine them saying, look, we are risking, we are risking uh, disillusion here. They say the, uh, the truth is the first casualty of war. I hope we have given you some facts to think about here and really appreciate your attendance and your attention and your great questions today. Thank you very much. Ian, thank you. Special thanks to our panelists. Uh, really incredible, enlightening conversation. I really appreciate all your perspectives and for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, on behalf of KYW News Radio and Odyssey, I want to thank the World Affairs Council too, particularly Haley Boyle and Caitlin Haney for being really, really fantastic partners in, in putting this together. Uh, and thank you all for coming today and uh, being here in person to see our space. Those of you watching on the live stream, uh, we appreciate you and, and your thoughts. If you missed any part of this and you're watching on the live stream, uh, it'll be available on demand later through both the KYW News Radio and the World Affairs Council uh, YouTube channels. So again, appreciate you being here. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>